recently upgraded my coach batteries to these 400 amp lithium server rack batteries. Today I'll be connecting my alternator charged directly into these lithium battery packs. Is this going to overheat and damage my alternator? Well, today we'll find out. I have three main ways of charging my batteries. Uh, first is, of course, with the AC power, either from the shore or generator. Uh, second method is with the solar. Third way to charge your batteries is using the uh, engine alternator. So uh, right now I don't have it hooked up because I had to investigate it. But uh, anyway, I think I would like to be able to use the alternator if when I need to. The biggest problem is that the lithium batteries can charge at a very high rate. And yeah, they're going to suck a lot of power from that alternator. Mercedes-Benz would only allow upfitters like Winnebago to use 40 amps from the alternator. However, Mercedes-Benz is a very conservative company and last year they revised their, their notes and specifications to allow up to 80 amps. Yeah, 80 amps is a lot. So why the change? Well, I can't be 100% sure, but, uh, but I know they're using the same alternator on these V6 engines from about 2010 up to 2022. This isn't the first time Mercedes has adjusted their specs. I know like for the oil change interval, in the early years, you know, 2010 or so, they're only allowing 10,000 miles between oil changes. And then they changed it to 15,000 and uh, 25, I think it was 2015, they changed it to 20,000 miles. Do you actually need to use a DC to DC charger? Uh, yeah, I personally know uh, some friends that don't have any. The alternator is wired directly into the battery and they haven't had any issues. And I also know a lot of people that have uh, used one to in order to follow the Mercedes-Benz 40 amp requirement. Of course, the new spec is 80 amps and it can probably provide a lot more. According to the spec sheet, the alternator can provide 180 amps at 2000 RPM. So even if you're running the uh, air conditioning or the heater at full blast, uh, yeah, you probably have about 130 amps left over for battery charging. Of course, if I was renting out my RV, that'd be a different story. Uh, yeah, you never know what a renter's going to do, so uh, yeah, they could be using every appliance they have, uh, especially if you get a few hair dryers going all at the same time. And of course, if you have a really big uh, battery pack along with a 3,000 watt inverter, you might want to get something in order to limit the current to under 80 amps. For me, I don't really use a hair dryer, and uh, we don't use a lot of 12-volt uh, power. And when we are using things like the uh, microwave and the air conditioning, uh, we're stopped anyway. So the uh, batteries and the inverter are providing all the power. Uh, yeah, I would just use the alternator to charge it once we are driving again, if necessary. Another reason not to use one is, yeah, I looked at the specs. Uh, these DC-DC chargers, they're only like 85-90% efficient, so you're wasting a little bit of power. Uh, yeah, they can cost a fair amount of money, especially if you want the higher current ones. For me, a 40 amp charger would, yeah, it would take me like 10 hours of driving to charge up my 400 amp hour battery pack. If I can get away with it, I'm not going to use one. I like the option to be able to use the uh, alternator, uh, especially when the sun's not shining and the solar isn't charging, or if I can't run the generator for some reason. Still, like a lot of people, I've seen that smoking alternator video from Victron. I watched it a couple of times and yeah, some of the things just didn't make sense to me. Although it requires a battery management system, as we are here and using it for tests, it's without one. Both batteries have a built-in BMS uh, that protects the battery and limits the charging and discharging. So why do they run their batteries without a BMS? Especially at low alternator speeds, the so needed cooling is lacking. When I looked closely at the label on the smoking alternator, yeah, I saw that it was a Citron alternator. <laughs> yeah, Victron makes stuff for RVs. They don't make things for Citron cars. <laughs> anyway, uh, best I could find out, uh, yeah, I couldn't read the model, but uh, looking at one similar online, uh, yeah, that alternator is only rated for 70 amps. What the heck? Mercedes alternator is 220 amps. So, <laughs> I don't know why they're testing a 70 amp car alternator unless they're really trying to smoke it on purpose. I also noticed that the alternator is just uh, mounted right there on a bench with no air moving over it. <laughs> yeah, you can tell that because of the smoke is going straight up. 
Seems to me this is just a marketing video. Victron currently produces three pieces of equipment that can protect both your alternator and your battery system. In order to sell their equipment, uh, yeah, they do offer a bunch of stuff that you can buy and put in. We've hoped you found this video useful. Now my battery pack has a good BMS that limits current in and out. Uh, and the alternator is mounted to a massive engine block. Uh, it's rated for 220 amps and it has constant air flowing over from the fan radiator, uh, even at idle, it's cooling it off. Mercedes makes a really good smart alternator and it has built-in current limiting, so yeah, I'm not so worried anymore. My first step is to measure the actual current uh, coming out of the alternator and going into my battery. Every installation could be different, so yours may vary, but anyway, in normal operation, the boost solenoid under the passenger seat will connect the uh, alternator and the engine to the uh, coach batteries for charging. This is the uh, red cable that goes to the engine, and this here on the other side is the house battery, so when the solenoid energizes, it hooks up the engine to the house batteries. And the house batteries over here, and this is the disconnect from where the battery cutoff switch is by the, by the door. In my case, I want to be able to only charge the lithium batteries from the alternator when I want to. That means I'll need to add a switch to the dash so I can turn it on or off. I found this uh, illuminated switch that's uh, made to fit into the dash, bringing one of those uh, little panels that's blocked off. After installing the lithium battery pack a couple months ago, uh, yeah, I kind of left the golf cart batteries there because I didn't know what to do with the alternator charging. So I had them hooked up so the alternator only charged the golf cart batteries and the solar and the AC uh, charged up the lithium batteries. Uh, that worked fine, but right now it's like, yeah, I don't need to carry that extra 120 pounds around anymore, so I'm deleting the golf cart batteries. But before I do that, let's test and see how much charging current they actually draw. So first I had to remove the passenger seat uh, to get to the boost solenoid. I ran some tests just charging the golf cart batteries. We started out around uh, 60, 65 amps and then dropped down into the 30s. With the golf cart batteries. Then I switched into the lithium batteries. So with both the lithium and the golf cart batteries. The lithium batteries are at 77% state of charge. Uh, there's really nothing running in the coach right now. It's just recharging at 60 amps. So I think we're good. While I was wiring in the switch, I decided, yeah, I think maybe it'd be nice to have an amp meter where I can just mount it in the dash and monitor the current draw. Well, it didn't work out so well. I tried hooking up this amp meter and voltmeter, but uh, apparently you can't put the shunt on the positive lead. So that's all I have is a positive lead in this box. There's no negative there from the alternator. So yes, I'm just going to use the Victron battery management uh, thing. That shows the current draw and so that'll be fine. The wire in the switch, uh, I just cut into the yellow lead going to the boost solenoid, uh, put my switch in there and then mounted the switch up in the dash. Now the alternator will not charge my batteries unless the switch is on and the engine is running. Got my switch hooked in here and there's no current. Let's push the switch, that comes on. Charging. Cool. I did leave the trickle start hooked up. Company says that you really should replace it with a, uh, I think it's an ampel start or something like that. However, it's only like a quarter of volt difference in the output. So, uh, yeah, seventy-three dollars. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's close enough. Uh, I'm actually going to just put some diodes in there to drop the voltage a little bit. So it'll be the same difference, and I won't have to change it. I wanted to measure the worst case condition for my battery pack, so I drew the battery down to seventeen percent state of charge. I started the engine, let it idle for an hour as it was recharging the battery. It's up started. It's not charging yet until we turn on the alternator. All right, there we go. Yeah, 75 amps. That's not bad at all. In that hour, the alternator added 64 amp hours back into my battery. Charging current slowly went down as the battery was filling up. So over that whole hour, the current never went over 80 amps. So yeah, I'm good. It's an hour later, been charging at idle. Diesel particulate filter is about the same. Hasn't changed at all. Engines up the temperature. So yeah, 
I think it's fine. Let me go check the alternator temperature, see how hot it's gotten after an hour. Well, the engine's up the temperature, but I don't see any smoke coming from the alternator. Let's just see what we got on the housing temperature. 180 degrees, but for reference, about the same as the uh, oil pan. So, okay. And in the cell. Yeah, the engine's a little hotter than the alternator. So this is running cooler than the uh, engine. All right, I think we're fine. In conclusion, I'm not going to put in a DC-DC charger. Yeah, it's just an extra expense, extra labor, and I don't really need it. Hope you enjoyed the video. This is Grandpa Ron, and I'll see you on the road.